part two. This will be a part where you may want to get in and play along if you've got computers with you. If not, we're going to go through things to begin with. Um, how many here people are C programmers? Fortran? I'm really sorry. <laughs> I go back farther than you. I was going to say. Uh, R, uh, MATLAB. <laughs> I know we have R, but the, the, this, the programming stuff here is going to be, is mainly going to be in C. If you don't, aren't programming C, or at least Fortran, and you're, this will not be the section for you. Just giving you a forewarning here. You might get some, uh, get some insights on how things work kind of under the covers. But this is really good. this is really kind of a, a programming. I took Fortran in I think the spring of 1990, if I remember correctly. And I remember telling, saying that somebody's got to pay me a lot of money if they have a program on Fortran, and they're paying me fairly good now, so I'll learn if I need to. But <laughs> I, I haven't had to to this point. So all the examples we're going to have here are going to be in C. Like I said, this is definitely the part if you. Uh, if you get bored and need to go take a break, I will not at all be offended. I certainly understand. Okay. Other question. Could you please put the command online? If they wanted to copy that stuff into their home directory to look at it, play with it, would you mind bringing it on the screen? Absolutely. I'll just put it. Sure, Blake. Thank you, Mark. Um, all of these, I, I, I put up here that you can be, it can be copied from here. Let me just write the command. Uh, let's pull up something. You can see it nice and big. Edit that one, it's just a viewer, so. Uh, why don't you just write it on the try it on the screen? Write it on the board. Alright, we're gonna do that. Don't write it on the screen. We'll get annoyed with you if you do. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so you're gonna CP build a use a different Chimney Christmas. Sorry. <laughs> That one's ghostwriting. Noticed. See, this where there we are. Tilda. Kyle Hudson. Slash. Bayo cat. Info. Slash. File name. Space. The little triangle there instead of space and a dot. If you want to copy them all, instead of putting file name, just use an asterisk. That will copy everything over to your current directory. So this one is called Fork Example. How many of you, uh, I, I already asked, there's only a few C guys here. How many of you guys have programmed with forks before? Anybody? Okay, don't give them any spoilers, because there's some spoilers ahead. <coughs> I say, this is... You get info or intro? Intro. intro. Oh, dang it, I wrote it down wrong. Thank you. That's what happens when you glance at your screen. Thank you. Okay, this is how we do parallel programming. Is this is this is the old style, where you got to kind of get started with forks. And and the reason why I'm starting there is because I have to give you some insights into how things work, even with the new styles. Um, I have a stainless steel. These are really kind of tiny. I wonder if I can get this bigger. I'm gonna open up in a. I didn't realize it was going to look that small on the screen here. That was one of the reasons I suggested telling them how to copy it so they could get their own local copy. Uh, let's see. I think I can change settings. <coughs> Ha 
be big enough we can see it, right? That's better. I want to turn off highlighting. What's a quick key for that? Uh, no idea. <coughs> I hate when I get my keys in the wrong way. Actually, let's do it this way. Uh, I'll turn the highlighting off. Okay. Big enough, hopefully, we can see everything now. Oh, dude, they got some standard includes here. That's boring stuff. I'm not going to worry about that. I'm gonna, I made a variable here called var underscore glb for a global variable. Is that for me? No? Okay, fine. Oh, no, fork <laughs> underscore example. Okay, thanks. Dot C. And I have three of my fork, fork example one, two, fork example, fork example two, and fork example three. So this is the first one. Um, start with my main program here. I create a uh, one of our built-in types is for a for a PID file. What's PID? Anybody? No. Process ID. That's uh, when you look at the system. Uh, if you if you do a process list, that'll be the number that's listed off to the side of the process. The, the process number the system keeps track of. Like I said, if you, if you really want to check out, I'm not be offended if you walk out. That's, I have a local variable and I initialize it to zero. Then I do what's called a fork, and a fork takes a process and it makes an exact copy of it in a parallel process. So now I'm using two cores, or two CPUs, depending on how your machine is, and they both have the same exact information. So they both have this global variable, they both have this local variable, initialized to zero. So. So is it a mirror process? It creates an exact, it makes a copy. Okay. So, and, that's technically not quite correct, but for all intents and purposes, it, you can just pretend that it just takes a copy of everything that's in memory and makes another copy of it, okay? They, they use some optimization to make it not quite so as resource intensive, you don't have to wait for that to happen. So, basically what this does is this checks to see if the fork was successful. We, have two, we now have two processes. We have what's called the parent, the one that started it, and we have the child process. So here we're going to check and see if we're at the child process. If it is, then we're going to increment the local variable, so it should now be one, right? We're going to implement the global variable, so it should now be one also. And then we're going to get just output what we have here. Child process, local variable, going to print it, global variable, going to print that one. If we're not in the child process, we're going to set our local variable to 10 and increment our global variable by 2. And the rest of it is all just making sure that everything worked right. So what do we expect to see on here? We have two lines, child parent process and parent process. What do, what do we expect to see uh, as our output? Depending on where the process is running. Right, running. it's going to actually do it twice. You're going to see both these lines one from each process. So we're going to see var local as 1, var local as 10, and then we're going to have our global. We're going to increment by 1, and we're going to increment by 2. Right? So let's do this real quick. We're going to GCC, work example, and we're going to run it. And here's what we got. Just so happens that the parent finished first this time. Sometimes this is not deterministic. Sometimes you'll see parent process first, sometimes you'll see child process first. If I ran this several times, it's not necessarily going to be one or the other. Our local variable on the on the parent process, what we expected, we got 10, and we increased it by 2, so we got 2. <coughs> the next one, local variable, we increased by 1. That's what we expected, we got 1. Global variable, still a 1. It didn't increase 
it didn't increase by one because it was, it was two up here and now it's, at, now it's at one. It created a copy of the global variable too. Even though I wanted it to be global, it didn't do it. Okay, that makes it tricky because when you make a copy of the program, it, a lot of times we're not worried about just what we're doing right now. We're trying to change several different variables through the way. So, how are we going to correct that? Let's try again. Those of you guys of you who know C, how do we, how do we uh, deal with things on a more global basis? Global variables. Global variables. How do we how do we address them? We use point. Of, this is the way that we that we tend to do things. Is instead of using and changing just the variable, we say change what points to that variable. For those of you who aren't in C, I'm sorry. I really am. <laughs> We, just, we basically did, I just made a copy of the same program. And made some changes here. I made a global variable two, except I made it a pointer. Um, so we have both a, both a global, global variable one, global, global variable two. I, I initialize them both. Again, I fork the process, and I increment the one by one, I increment the other one by two. Now, what do you think happens? Any guesses? Wrong. It's not. This is not really intuitive. This is really frustrating for people who do this for the first time ever, including myself. It's been many years since the first time I did it, but even getting back into it after a while, these are things you forget. It not only changes the, whenever it makes a copy of it, it makes a virtual copy of your address space too. So even though you're saying what points the location, 2,472,713. Whenever you address what's that, that memory location, it has a virtual copy of that also. It makes it really frustrating. So how the heck do we do this? Oh. And as I went through here, this, is, this was actually my first attempt at, at, at demonstrating this. That's what I got, came up with. Bzz, wrong. I thought it was useful because I figure if I make that mistake, I'm probably not the only one making that mistake also. So here is the right way to do it. There's one more uh, call here. Uh, include, we have to include. That's a memory map. And it includes some magic here. And again, that's the reason why I put it out there for you guys to copy, because this takes this memory map uh, function takes some uh, some bizarre parameters. You have to tell it how big it is and what permissions you want to have on it and all that kind of stuff. But then, after I get done with that, then I can have my <coughs> global variable two to be zero. Increase. Uh, do exactly what I was doing before. Everything down here did not change a bit. I changed my the pointer of my global variable, so you still gotta use pointers. And now when I compile it, and run it, now you notice that finally it incremented by two on one set and two, and one on another. In all of these cases, that the parent process end up finishing first. But that's not always the case. I bet, let's see. Parent finished first. Oh, it. Hate not being on my own keyboard. <laughs> It'll eventually happen. Yeah. 
the thing is, you, you can't tell which is going to be, especially when you get to multiples. Now, uh, how, what do you have to do if you want to create, if you want to use on three different processors? What do you have to do? Create two tiles? Yeah, you have to fork it a, third, a second time, or a third time, or a fourth time, or however many you want to do. It's, it's an incredibly tedious process. So in each fork, you only create two? Each four copy of the current one. Of a okay. You get a copy of the current one. Okay. So you, now, 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 if you have three lines that said fork, 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 the first one creates two copies, and then they both go to the second fork, and they create two copies. Okay. And so that's then you, that's, right. and the, the technical term for this is a fork bomb. Okay. If you uh, put it in, you get it too many of those, and that's a good way to either kill the machine or get your job killed, depending on how we configure things. Okay. Hopefully we configure it to kill your job. <laughs> when I when I was first playing with forks back as a college student back in the 1990s, um, we I ended up with about a half page worth of code that, due to some syntax errors, really evaluated to while one fork, while one was always true, it would fork and fork and fork and yeah, I got some sysadmins that were not happy with me at that. Fortunately, I was on a machine they didn't care that much about, so they could just. Rebooted, but <laughs> they they were not happy with me. Along comes some really smart people, and said, "All of this working with works is a pain in the rear. We need to have a better way." So they came up with a system called OpenMP. So I stole more examples. I didn't even adapt these. Those, those last ones I adapted some. <coughs> these I just took. Um, OpenMP requires some different libraries. So when we when we uh, compile those, I'll use the dash open f OpenMP. Um, but we have some different ways of doing things, and it makes programmers' lives much much easier. What did I call them? Oh, MP, hello. So these. We got another library we have to use, an open MP library. We have our main program. Got a couple integers, number of threads, and the thread ID number that we're working with. It uses its own syntax. If you're not using this, it's going to see this as a comment, and it's going to not work at all. But this is this is the uh, syntax they use. It's pragma, OMP, parallel, and you tell it what parts you want private, which parts you want public. So private, we're going to say that within your thread, we want in threads and the thread ID. We're just going to say get the thread number, we're going to give it a hello world, world from thread, whatever, the master thread only, which is the thread ID zero, which is a special designation. Instead of getting a process ID like and having to compare it like we did with a fork, it just says if by the thread ID the first one is, is zero. So if the thread ID is zero, then it says give the number of threads. I think that's all there is in this. Yeah. And it's done with this part because we have, we, we've given it this these brackets here. We told it this is what we're doing here. Then when it gets done with that, it collapses everything together and makes life a whole lot easier because you don't have to do any cleanup work or anything like that. It does all that for you. So now we don't have processes, we have threads. Threads, yes. Okay, and where did the parallelization occur? That came. And what's the difference? Right. Actually, most people use them interchangeably. Technically, I gotta get this right. Process is always on a separate CPU. A thread can be a different. No. Um, did I get it wrong? I teach operating systems. Yes, I know. I, I don't. <laughs> Tell them the difference. Okay. So, so, so if you if you call a fork, that gives you two processes. If you think about a process, is it separate memory spaces? 
which means that you have global, like you, have, you have A is a global variable in one, when you fork it, you have two A's sitting there. And they can't access each other's memory, they have to pass messages back and forth using MPI or something like that if they want to communicate. Multiple threads are in the same memory space. If you've got one variable called A sitting up there as a global variable, any of them can use it. <coughs> so the advantage of, of multi-threaded, like OpenMP, is that forking out the thread is a relatively fast process. Forking out the process is a relatively slow process, just to overload and confuse things. Um, it, tends to be, it tends to be lower overhead, and you don't have to worry about, because you only have one copy of A sitting there, you don't have, it becomes simpler for a programmer to think about. I update A, I update A, I don't have 18 copies of it all named A sitting there if I had multiple copies of multiple processes. Problem is, the biggest problem is scalability. If you're using threads, you can't go across multiple machines. If you're using processes, like MPI uses multiple processes, then you can go across multiple machines and therefore get greater scalability and therefore ultimately greater performance at the cost of, it's gonna be more of a pain in the butt to program. What he said? <laughs> <laughs> I think I need to audit your class. <laughs> so, and if you want a much more in-depth explanation, take my CIS 450 computer architecture course, and we'll talk about it a lot. <laughs> but you asked where this where this happened. That was on this line. You told we told it do this in parallel. Now. One thing I will tell you is if you go to use OpenMP, and I, I think I have this on here, make sure that you set the limit if you go to use this in, in, on Beocat. These examples, it's fine because these are running for seconds. This will use as many city cores as it can get a hold of. So yeah, if you go to run this on a mage and you think you're only using two or three, you can make some sys administrators mad if you're using this in real life for anything. Only yeah. briefly before they take it out on your process. Yes, <laughs> yes, this is true. Um, the other the other thing that can happen, and this has run into some of my my programmers, is because this automatically uses all the cores available. If they're doing benchmarking and they're trying to say how does my code work for two cores, for four cores, for eight cores, and their code automatically always uses eight cores, their graph looks an awful lot like a line rather than a curve. I guess technically. A, well, okay. Um, <laughs> you get the idea. And so that is something you just keep an eye on is how many how many threads am I actually using uh, versus how many am I, do I think I'm using and we've got to go from there. There is, I think I put this, yeah. There's a, there's a, a uh, branch. Again, I would suggest that you get my PowerPoint by copying it and using that there. Set none threads. We'll tell you, it's, it, that will tell you, don't use any more than that many cores on a machine. We don't have them on here, because like I said, these are running so fast that they're done by the time you even notice they're using them. So it's not gonna be a big deal for these. <coughs> so we're going to gcc-f open mp, mp hello.c. <coughs> Here's what it did. Remember one of these children? Eight of them, because we're running on the head node, which happens to have eight cores. It said, it gave me a hello world for each one of these. Now, this one I know. What can we say about the order of that? Whichever one it happened to see first. It's completely non-deterministic. I'm running the exact same program several times, and it's given me Different order of the output. Every every one of those child <coughs> children are coming out mm -hmm. in, in a different spot. So which one is the parent and which one is the child there? <coughs> the zero is the parent. You look up here. The master thread is number zero. So you saw that it said. So it did this part first. Even on uh, even on all of them did this. It said hello world from thread, you'll see there was a zero on there. Okay. But then it said after it was done, then it, then it printed how many okay. threads there were. 
And there's nothing that says you have to use thread zero. There are just convention thread zeros designated the boss, okay. but you can use whatever you want to. Just if you use something else, people will look at you funny and say, "Why didn't you use zero? <laughs> it's much easier if you keep it that way. And it's it's like when you're programming a for loop. Use i and j and k. Don't name it something fancy. <laughs> Another OpenMP example here. Let's do let's just do some more cool stuff here. We've created some variables here, a chunk size and n, and the n is uh, the the size of a of a list of numbers that we got here. Set the initialization uh, up through n, so up through 100, we say. A is the same as B, which is I times one, so that's going to get basically I'm giving you a floating point. So we have 1.0 through 100.0. Okay. Now we've told it that we're sharing all of these between things. This is this is this is what makes OpenMP really nice to work with. Is you say I'm sharing this data. I'm making this private to the thread. So my i, my, my variable that I, I'm using for my loop on the inside here, that's going to be separate inside each one of these threads. So that well, lets me program with things. I don't have to worry about what's going on in the outside world. And these are shared to the outside world. Once again, if, the, if we're the master thread, then we tell, ask how many threads, we print how many threads there are. Um, uh, let's see what we I got it. I got the wrong example. <laughs> for schedules, I mean, oh, we're, so we're saying we're going to grab this many at a time. That's what this does. Um, you can come on in. I'm not going to hurt anything. We're in and out. Very easy. Go on here. We're, we're computing some third number, C. But we're doing it at this chunk at a time. That's what the that's what the, the schedule does. Chunk at a time. So we're doing it. If you saw, if you saw that the chunk was ten. So now when we run this one, <coughs> this is seat over here. If you want to sit down. Yeah, I see a couple seats over there. <coughs> So, first of all, we had process three start, we had process eight start. This is finally getting to the point where the master one said, oh, yeah, I'm here too. Told you, whatever order it happens to be in, it happens to be in. Number three does its work. Then number six starts, then number seven starts. Then number seven does its work. As it's in the middle of number seven doing its work, the other ones are starting. One's doing its work. Three is doing its work. But you notice each one does 10 at a time because that's how big the chunk size we told it to do. So you're going to grab this much at a time. It can, it can uh, achieve some efficiencies by doing it that way. But you notice also that this is working on 38 and 39. This is working on 9 and 10. 4 is working on 40 in, in the 40s. Whatever it happened to grab next. down to the end. And even like, <laughs> you'd think that number, you know, the 90 would be last, but not necessarily, because that's when it happened to grab them. That's, again, if I, and if I run it again, this one we ended up with 27, 28, 29. If we run it again, wow, 26, 27, 28, 29, <coughs> surprise. There we are, 46 through 49. Again, completely non-deterministic, running the same program. One more open open MP example, then we'll move on. 
What's the most common thing that people do in try to do in parallel? Matrix inversion? No. No, they're close. It's a, it's a, there's actually, and there, they actually have a matrix uh, <coughs> directives already built in. That, that, again, that's like, it's very close. The most common thing though you see is for loops. So they see, this. that's what this one does. We do some initializations. Instead of making them just one through 100 like we did before, uh, we take this one, multiply it by 1.5. We take b is i times plus 22. So we just have some, some different numbers out there. And we initialize c and d to 0. Then we say, parallel, we, we're telling which part we're sharing, which parts are private. We get the number of threads. And section, yeah, where did I get my screen here? Notice these are nested. So this part's on the outside, this part's on the inside. This section it does, and this section it does. And down here, this is where we have our for loop. And that for loop basically is running through that loop. There are, and there are one, there are open MP directives for matrices also. That lets it basically, it keeps you from having the situation where say one thread gets done really fast and it's sitting there waiting for things to do. And it was really slow when the person that got done fast can take up the slack basically once it gets done. That's what this all does. This one happens to be for a for loop but it does the same thing for the others. And I gave, I gave the link up here. There are more examples over here. Lawrence, Lawrence Livermore National Labs. But Based on, on what you said before, the difference between <coughs> different threads, mm -hmm. for loops would be better suited for threads introducing the open MP then. Typically, you, normal, normally if, if someone is saying, if I want to jump from a single threaded program, which is the way we usually program a program, right. to I want to start taking advantage of multiple threads and therefore multiple floors and go parallel, OpenMP is usually a really good place to start. It's kind of the most gentle introduction usually. Right. And since usually 90% of the time the program spends is going to be spent in, the for, in some for loops, mm -hmm. and that's kind of what this is aiming at, it's getting you hopefully 80% of the total performance of parallelizing your code for 20% of the work. Okay. The last 80% is gonna cost you the next 80% of time okay. if you wanna go there. But if you wanna say, hey, let's try this out and work with it, this can be a really easy way to do it. Okay. Um, the easiest way to do it is ignore this completely and try to make use of scale attack or blast or something that can automatically take advantage of parallelism <coughs> if you happen to have the right labor library that will do it for you. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, then this is, this is a really okay. good way to start. So run this again with the for loop. You notice like thread six there near the bottom, four and one, two. They were all just getting started by the time everybody else, the work had already been done. So those were the, th the slow threads. The others had already been done ahead of time. So that's, that's, that's the advantage of using a built-in library instead of trying to roll your own with you know, saying, I'm gonna break this up and you do this part and you do this part and you do this part. Let it figure all that out for you. And like I say, if, you, if this is what interests you, I'm going to do some more work on this. There's a, that link up at the top. That's where I got all these examples from. And uh, there, there are more there, including, including how to use matrices. They have built-in directives for using matrices. So now we want to scale beyond the machine. We're going to use something called MPI. This is just the Wikipedia definitions. It's a standardized portable messaging system between machines. It can be used on one machine. It can be used on multiple machines. That's how we get uh, if people who want to take real, really are taking our best use of BeoCat, the ones using lots of things. It's what we were just talking about back there with you know MPI spread. We're moving things across many machines, getting lots of work done at one time. They're all talking back and forth. Now, again, once again, I stole examples because they're really good at this. 
this is uh, Henry Neiman. I, I gave you the link for the OU. I'll give it up here again. He uses this one. Imagine you're on an island in a little hut, and on the hut is a desk. On the desk is a phone, a pencil, a calculator, a piece of paper with instructions, and a piece of paper with numbers. The instructions are what to do. Uh, it says add the number in slot 27, the number in slot 239, put the result in slot 71. The number in slot 71 is equal to the number in slot 118, then call this number and leave a voicemail containing that number to slot 692. Otherwise, call your voicemail box and collect a voicemail and put that number in 715. And then we got data down here, a whole bunch of things. Now, if you're in that situation, what do you know about what you're doing? How much, of the, how much of what's going on do you know? Very, very little. Exactly, you know what you need to do. You have some instructions, you have some data. You don't have any idea what else is going on. Two different kinds of instructions here. You have arithmetic instructions, logical instructions, like the adding and the comparing, and we have communications. We're saying, if you're gonna call this number, leave a voicemail, or you're gonna call your, your own voicemail, listen for a message in this guy, and you're going to write, you got to change your data. If you're on a hut in an island, you aren't specifically aware of anybody else out there. That's the way this MPI works. You don't know what else is going on. Your, your job is really focused. You're doing the one thing. And especially you don't know whether anybody else is working on the same problem, or for that matter, a different problem. And you don't know who's at the other end of the phone line. You're just using voicemails to communicate back and forth. All you know is what to do with the voicemails you get and what numbers that, that you send the voicemail to. He uses people's names and I have no idea where he comes up with these. I, I told you I stole these slides outright. Now suppose that Horst, somebody else is on another island, the same kind of hut with the same kind of equipment. Suppose he has the same list of instructions as you but a different set of numbers. Just like you, he doesn't know if there's anybody else working on the problem. I have other two more people, Bruce and Dee. Each of them has the exact same list of instructions, a different list of numbers. And, but you could be talking to each other. There's not necessarily saying you could be talk, talking to the same central authority. You may, you may not be, we don't know. You might all be working together on the same problem. That's what OPMP is trying to, to solve, or excuse me, MPI is trying to solve. But your data are all to you. You have no way of sharing data other than one at a time leaving voicemails. Just like on a, a phone call, there's two costs. The connection cost and the per minute cost. And this leads to this YouTube video, which you may or may not have seen. volume on here. <laughs> I didn't even think about having the thing plugged into here. So the 10, 10, 220. How do those guys make any money if they're giving you phone calls for 20 minutes for a, for a buck? How do they make any money? What's the average price for a phone call? Zero. <laughs> for those of you not using <laughs> Skype. <laughs> <laughs> what's, the, what's the average cost for a long distance phone call? Eight after seven. Right. <laughs> on the cell phones, yes. About 10 cents a minute for, for your traditional cost. They're giving you 20 minutes for, for a buck. So how, how are they making that work? How do they make any money off that? They're, they're going to the wholesale. Let's say it costs them 7 cents a minute instead of 10. How are they making any money off that? That's, that's only 5 cents a minute. 
if you're taking 20 minutes and divide it into a dollar. I'll make up for the volume. You call less than 20 minutes? By calls less than 20 minutes. You know what the average length of a phone call is? Three minutes. So they're getting a dollar for you. So that's 33 cents a minute instead of 20 cents a minute. So there's a connection charge. That's what they're doing here. They're, 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 taking, they're making it sound like a per minute charge. You got a connection <laughs> charge, which is the fixed cost of connecting your phone to someone else's only if you're only connected for a second. And the per minute charge is the cost per minute of talking once you're connected. So if the connection charge is large, then you want to make as few calls as possible. Now, they did some benchmarking there at OU, and uh, let's see if they have this here. Nope. They don't have it on here. They said it's basically the equivalent in, in real terms of doing this kind of a system, except having a $150 connection charge and then having one cent per minute after 10 days. So the, so the setup fee is huge. And that's the way we see with MPI programs is the connection, you know, to make that initial connection is huge. And we see this a lot because we have people trying to make uh, MPI calls and they're not really doing anything with it. They're making a couple calculations and sending things back. And if you're gonna do that, well, the time it took you to do the communication was longer than it would be just to do it yourself anyway. So what we wanna do is, we wanna, if we're gonna do it, we're gonna, we need to make sure that we're doing something that will scale to this this level that we that we use MPI effectively, and there are a lot of program a lot of uh, programs that we do run on BayoCap that fall squarely into this category. That would it be a, the opposite to what we were just talking about G GPUs there, rather than having very small type of operations that run very fast, trying to look at larger operations. Actually, it's very similar. GPU, a lot, of, a lot of GPU programming has the same program, is it takes a long time to take, take your data and copy it into the GPU, mm -hmm. yeah. and then do some work on it. And then do some work on it. So the more you're doing copying in and out, the longer it takes. Okay. So, 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 the, so the gist of it is, any, anytime you're working with you know, multiple processes or using MPI, so essentially, as, as soon as you carve your program into either separate machines or separate address bases, communication tends to start off Anytime you initiate communications, it gets expensive. So you want to minimize the number of phone calls you make. But once you make one, blah. Usually I got it. <laughs> you know, talk for a long time. So rather rather than sending 10, 10 word messages, send one 100 word message, and you're probably going to get overall much better performance. So using this, what are the advantages of, of using MPI? One of them we saw in the definitions, if anybody was or did not read through the entire definition. Different programming languages. Because, because it's an open standard, we have it at, you know, some people use things in Fortran, people use things in C, there's all sorts of implementations. There's, a, there's an R implementation of MPI um, that, you know, that what, it, because you're only limited with, the, dealing with a limited number of instructions, limited number of uh, connections, you can talk among those programs fairly easily. Interaction among different machines. Uh, we just talked. I just talked to somebody during the break. Was you going to be using 64 different machines of BeoCat? One of those things. He said it actually ran faster than running on a single machine, which shocked the socks out of me. But I'll take it. It's really good for data collection. If you have one central central node that you're using to collect data from several different places. This guy can talk to it, that guy can talk to it, you can talk over there. Um, you don't necessarily need to talk to, have these different nodes talking to each other. You can, there's nothing wrong with it. But it works really well for um, something very similar to what we use for a world, world community grid, where they say, whenever, whenever we don't have any jobs running on BeoCat, we join world community grid, which is based out of, where? New York City. New York City. And, they, they say, work on these calculations for a while. And they give us a bunch of data and a bunch of uh, programs to run. They run it and send it back to them. And they are solving big, huge problems that we don't have to deal with here. We don't want, we only have that running whenever, like I said, whenever we're sitting idle and no need to have machines like that sitting not doing anything. And scaling. 
obviously we can scale to several hundred CPUs even in this case, even on our, our little system. Uh, they can all talk to each other, whereas the biggest thing, individual node that we have on BayoCat is 80 cores. We can get beyond that with MPI by scaling that even larger. Disadvantages, cost of getting started. Uh, we do try to minimize that. We run InfiniBand between our bigger nodes, which is very low latency. That's the, that's the process to get started. Doesn't solve the problem, but it helps. And again, it's not efficient for small amounts of data. And it's complex to code. It's a lot harder to debug. Yes. Because you've got, you've got potentially you're running on 10 different machines and one of them decided to start up slowly or something like that. And so then you get the error message that says, hi, one of your 10, 10 jobs failed. Or maybe you don't get any error message at all. And it says, I'm shutting down your system. Um, and then trying to sort it out. In general, OpenMP, so a single threaded program is, as you all know, a pain in the butt to debug, but certainly a reasonably common task and you're used to it. Go multi-threaded with OpenMP, it's still a pain in the butt, somewhat more so. Go, go MPI, where you have multiple individual programs all running, it just multiplies the way things can go wrong. And so uh, it's something where if you need it for scalability or for performance, like, you, like Kyle was talking about the advantages, it's awesome. If you need to integrate some Fortran libraries with some C programs and run them all in distributed fashion, works for it. But on the other hand, you have to kind of decide, is this really worth it or not? <laughs> and uh, if it isn't, then, you know, you might stay If your program will run in a couple hours anyway, don't mess with it. <laughs> you know, or even, even a couple of days, maybe. But if you've got something that's going to be running for months, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to go into, I, I do have one example, you can copy it from my directory because we're getting short on time here. But there's a, again, you can copy this file back to your own directory, this MPI example. Uh, stole it from Colorado. You know, if you steal from one person's plagiarism, you steal from lots of research, right? So I'm stealing from lots of places. Um, there, there, there is one gotcha, and that is you have to actually compile with MPI CC. So is that one using OpenMP and MPI? No. Then why do you need the... Open yes, it is. I'm sorry, but yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, you're right, it is. It is. Okay. So that's why this one uses both the OpenMP. They had to go and make things with very similar names <laughs> that do completely different things. Oh, actually, similar things, but not exactly the same. OpenMP, again, is the parallelism on within one machine, MPI, the implementation is called OpenMPI. So we have OpenMP and OpenMPI, which do different things, and you'll even catch us off guard if you're not, if we're not paying attention. Because so, yeah, and I'll interject following on Adam's thing. If you're a beginner, cover your ears and go blah, 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 because you don't want to listen to this. Um, if you're advanced or thinking about it, you can't actually combine the programming models. You can't have an OpenMP program that uses MPI and vice versa to get the best of both worlds. To get MPI so you can go across multiple machines, and use OpenMP on the same machine. This is something that, for instance, if you're coding for the National Supercomputer Centers, they'll say, oh, we like you because you're getting the most efficiency out of the machine. On the other hand, if you're just saying, look, I just want my program to run somewhat faster, run, run fast and far away from this. Because okay. it introduces whole new ways for your programs to explode. <laughs> And I will interject here that the, there are lots of toolkits that we have. These are already written to take advantage of as much as they can. Uh, some of these use MPI, some of them use, use OpenMP, some of them are still using the works. It doesn't matter because we don't care because it works and it's tested. So that's why we encourage people to use toolkits. If there's no, no need to reinvent invent the wheel, um, you can download your own, run it out of your own, own home directory. Uh, there are, yeah. there are lots of bioinformatics tools in the, there's, there's a user on BioCat called BioInfo. There are a lot of tools in that user's home directory that should be, that are fine to use. So for instance, uh, Top Hat and uh, I forget, uh, Cufflinks and BWA and that kind of thing, so. So, so if, do you if you find. List, uh, do you have a list about the bioinformatic tools? It's uh, my, um, it's the Kibrand lab. So I think it's oh, okay. that 
Okay. You shouldn't try going go from moms. Uh -huh. And then there's a folder called Bionico Software, uh, Bionico underscore software. Okay. So, like I said, if, if somebody's already written it, don't go to the hassle of trying to rewrite it yourself. It's not worth the effort. <laughs> and if it doesn't fit, that's one thing, but if it does, use it. That's why they're there. Once again, more information. There's the link for the, the OU Supercomputing in Plain English if you want that. And uh, it's up to see us. I only saw one person fall asleep, so I think we're all right. <laughs> yeah, right. Get up, move around. Next time, next hour is going to be on actual use of BayoCat itself. I need more drinks. My drink. <laughs>